Thank you for auditing the Always Positive New Music Review Show, hosted by a French professor who's going to talk about the new album, I Love You, Jennifer B. by Jockstrap. But first, I want to let you know like how I came to listen to this album for the first time. You see, I'm in a fairly high state of anxiety right now, just in general. In my life, you know, work just started. Work is very difficult right now, you know, because it's the beginning of the semester. And I have a 17-year-old baby, and I have two teenagers. So, like, you know, my life is very full. And it's reached the point where, like, I worry about my channel. I have enough success. I have enough subscribers that I want to keep that going. I want to keep those three videos a week coming out. I want to keep seeing the line go up for the analytics. But at the same time, I need to be present with my baby. I need to be present with my family. I need to be present with my students. <sighs> it's quite complicated. So it's reached the point where when it hits Friday, like I'm kind of anxious. You know, for New Music Friday, I have my title app and I, and I bring it out and like, I'm starting to dread it because it's like, am I going to review the albums I should review? Do I have the time to give that I need to them? What about the albums that I missed while I was in the hospital? <clears throat> All these things. So on Friday, I wasn't checking out the new music. My wife needed a break. I was in the nursery and I was on the, in the rocking chair. I was rocking back and forth with my, my new baby. And what should have been just a beautiful moment, but my mind was elsewhere, okay? <laughs> my mind was so elsewhere. I was going in between like playing Pokemon Go and reading the I Think You Should Leave subreddit. And I was, the whole time I was listening to some political analysis of the, 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 the legacy of Shinzo Abe, the assassinated Japanese prime minister. And, and, and like I have all this input going on, all this stuff happening. And yet there's no part of me that is present or enjoying what should be a nice relaxing moment after a hard day. Thankfully, I take a second and I go, oh, screw it. I'm just, I'm going to open up title and we'll see. Maybe there'll be something that'll jump out to me. Maybe something will jump out to me for my big weekend show. Maybe there'll be something that can reset the clock, can put me at zero. And there I see it, jockstrap. I press play and all of a sudden, Everything is good, <laughs> despite the fatigue, despite the two and a half hour faculty meeting that I sat through, despite the strife amongst my colleagues, despite the difficulty with my students and the absences and the latenesses, I'm sitting there and I'm rocking back and forth with my baby and I'm listening to this music that is perfect perfect for being present. It demands attention. You have to listen carefully. There's so many different parts. Every time you listen, something shifts, something grows, something changes. But at the same time, it's so agreeable and nice and melodic and sweet. It is this album of balance. This balance between music you really have to listen to and music you can just enjoy. And that's going to be the way I'm going to frame this album is of this beautiful, delicate balance. Or as I will explain in a second, a truce. Now, I sort of actually knew a lot about this band before I listened to them for the first time. So I've never listened to a single Jogstrap project. But when I saw their name, I remembered, I was like, okay, I'm not thinking, okay, I'm thinking of Chinstrap, the band from, the, the Scenester band from the 90s in Boston. This isn't Chinstrap. This is Jogstrap. Right, this is the band that the one member of Black Country New Road is in. And I forgot which one. It was George Ellery, the, the violinist. I interviewed her. It was great. And so I'm like, okay, so first of all, first thing I need to do is just not listen to this album as a Black Country New Road fan because that's, you, just, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> it's just a bad way to listen to music. Fortunately, that was not very difficult. And then I looked up and I realized the other person in Jockstrap was Taylor Sky. Great name. Not a lot of men out there with the name Sky, S-K-Y-E. So, we're like a little secret club. And I was like, why does that name ring a bell? It's because I reviewed him three years ago. Sweaty record review number 81, recorded out there on that porch. Currently sitting with, I believe, 90 views. Maybe not even 100. Definitely not 100 views. I think over 50, but under 100, which at that time was a lot of views. It got bumped up because Taylor Sky actually shared this video on Instagram. Thank you. So I went back and I watched my old review, cringe, I went back and watched my old review and I remembered what I liked so much about the album. This playfulness, this seriousness, the fact that it reminded me of the album Comic Opera by Robert Wyatt, which is one of my favorite albums of the century. 
so we have this great, wonderful collaboration between these two people. And, and I, I realized this term came to my mind while I was sitting there upstairs in the nursery of an easy truce between multiple different forces. Now, when you say truce, you're implying a war. And, and that's why I say easy truce. Like, it's a truce between two countries that have never been belligerents. This isn't like, you know, two people who don't like each other and are finding a way to work together. It's more like two different but compatible ways of making art in this great balance. Most evidently, that's seen in the truce between the electronic and the acoustic. The whole album is a beautiful confusion of electronic sounds and acoustic sounds. This beautiful, well-trained voice and this aggressively interesting, complex electronic production with so many different layers that you have to listen to it 20 times to figure out what's playing when. It's a truce between the silly and the serious. Like, at times the album is very serious. At times it's very silly. This is some of my favorite stuff that music can do. I love it when music takes itself seriously and doesn't at the same time. That can actually be seen in the name of the band, Jockstrap. The worst name of any good band in history. Truly terrible. <laughs> hey, we should name our band uh, something that makes you think of like unpleasant athletic men's uh, locker rooms and like their crotches in particular, like after working out. Like that's, you know that smell? You know that, that particular smell? Like... When you're in the changing room after a football game in middle school and, and it just smells like, like, like people's crotches, that's what we want our band to make you think of. But that's that playfulness. There's also a real interplay between irony and earnestness which I really enjoy. And I'm really hesitant to do this because it's very regressive. And I encourage you to throw tomatoes at your phone for me saying this. But it is partly, I think, a reflection of a kind of truce between a sort of male energy and a female energy. Oh my god, I said it. Unsubscribed. I unsubscribed for myself because there's no way I'm going to pull myself out of this point. Give me a second. I'm not going to say male energy and female energy. I'm going to use the term that I prefer, socialized male and socialized female energy. So, young men especially young male artists, are socialized to be very ironic, to be very cutting edge, to constantly take things to the very edge to where you go, is it real? Is it not real? What does he mean? What does he not mean? Whoa, what's he doing next? Okay, there's a lot of that energy on here. And that's a very ironic place to be because you don't really want to show your real emotions because if you're socialized male, you are socialized not to be overtly emotional. Patriarchy. And then on the other side, if one is an artist who is socialized female, you're encouraged to be earnest, to express those emotions, to be in that realm. And so there's this wonderful irony and this wonderful truce that comes between those two different forces. And I'm not saying it's yin and yang. I'm saying it's socialized yin and socialized yang. And, and I think that actually helps to really under, to underscore the fact that those binaries are not gendered. Like That's not actually the source of them. It's just society. Did I save myself? Did you ruin your phone with the tomato? Can you resubscribe? Oh, and smash the like bucket. Smash the like bucket and subscribe. And tell me in the comments. I didn't do my hair this morning, but it somehow works. So tell me, tell me if it works or if I should have used the gel. So, you know, we had this great truce. Electronic, acoustic, silly, serious, ironic, earnest. Sometimes too, like, like, like the, the, there's like a readable melody sometimes even a predictable melody, and then avant-garde sound collage, <laughs> you know, those things don't usually mix together. Artistic influences, you know, I hear a truce between Robert Wyatt and Joni Mitchell, between Leonard Cohen and Kraftwerk. But my favorite balance probably is, is in, just in general, the words and the music. And I think it's this, this truce, this balance between the feeling of home and away between the road and the bedroom. When I say road, I mean most of the lyrics, seems, have been written while she is on tour. I assume. I don't know. I, I didn't get to go see Black Country New Road in New York or in Baltimore. 
I have to, I, I can't look at them on Instagram. I want to go see them in concert so bad. It's painful. It really, really hurts. But I'm a family man. <laughs> so I took my daughter to see My Chemical Romance in Toronto instead of going to New York to see Black Country New Road. And that was the right decision. But you know, she's been on the tour. She's been all over the world. She's faced this adulation. She's had a lot of success in this band. And that's a very alienating feeling. It's a disassociating feeling. There's so many great lyrics all about feeling unmoored from reality and from existence. And that's what it is to be out on the road. But then the music by Taylor Sky, I don't know what his life is like. I assume he's not having the same experience. I assume he's not jet-setting all over the world because the music feels like it's all made in one bedroom. Like, I get the sense of somebody, like, sitting on the edge of his bed because, I don't know, his chair broke and he's got his computer and he's up at 4 o'clock in the morning and he's putting together all these sick beats and awesome songs and cool sounds and manipulations. So we have her out there in the world doing all these things and him inside in a very insular world at 4 a.m. eating what British people eat at 4 a.m. Hobnob biscuits and, and curry and builder's tea. That's as much as I have. Is that what British artists eat at four o'clock in the morning? You know, that balance is just great. And what it produced is an album that is filled with bangers and growers. So I played this album for my entire family. I've been listening to it nonstop for the past two days. Everyone likes it. My baby probably likes it the most of any of us. <laughs> it actually can calm her down. It's pretty weird. I mean, I'm probably reading into it. Uh, she's probably too young to really make out the differences, but who knows. Um, and, and that's really nice because that's a good sign for an album. But the thing that I noticed was this morning when I was listening to it, I do one last pass, you know, where I just sit down with lyrics and I just see what else I can pick up. Uh, and the songs that I liked the least the first four or five times I listened were the songs I liked the most this time. Or not the most, but the song, like I ended up liking them just as much as the rest. So I'll talk about that when I get to it. But for now, let's get to my stamp, my example song. If you've never heard anything by this band, click on the link there above the banana, Concrete Over Water. Link over banana, Concrete Over Water. If you don't like this song, I don't know what to tell you, bud. This this song is as good as any song I've heard this year. It does everything that Jockstrap does well. It also does basically everything I could ever want a song to do. It starts off very avant-garde with this backwards sound. I think it's the first verse backwards, but I don't know. It's like keyboard and organ underneath. Like, so it's, a, it's an organ sound that's very clearly not a real organ, but a keyboard playing that sound. Her voice comes in, kind of a jazzy singing. I live in the city, the tower's blue and the sky is black. I feel the night, I see it, it's on my back. It's just beautiful, again, singing about being out. She sings about being in Italy and Spain and in Champagne, which is a region of France. These beautiful vocal acrobatics, again, very reminiscent to me of Joni Mitchell, but that's just whenever I hear someone singing super high in a, in a very talented way, that's what I think of. And then we get to this chorus, this keyboard and whiny sound. I think there's a recorder. I don't remember much about my review uh, of the Taylor Sky album. Um, that was before I had a Patreon, and the Patreons get, give me money and I buy music. If I had a Patreon back then, I would have bought that Taylor Sky album. I listened to it again yesterday. It's, it's damn good. <laughs> it's a damn good album. Um, and the funny thing about the chorus is that, you know, you watch this channel because I'm smart. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you watch the, the channel because of my anecdotes about hanging out with my family. Maybe everything. I know, the one thing I know is you don't watch my channel for, uh, for reviews. I mean, for, like, you know, like a score. I'm not going to give you a score. You know, um, you don't watch my channel for snark. Uh, but, you know, I like to think that people are interested in my insight, my brain, and all that. But I couldn't figure out the title of this song for a long time. <laughs> I was like, Concrete Over Water, that's an interesting inversion. Because normally, you know, concrete doesn't float. So I had this image of like this plane, this like big empty plane of land with just this thin layer of water with concrete somehow floating on top of it. That was how I visioned it. And then I read the lyrics this morning. And I'm a dummy, dummy, dum dum. <laughs> Because she says, the bridge we stood, concrete over water. So, of course, that's when concrete is over water, when it's a bridge. Reminded me of Italy, Champagne, Spain. And the idea of, like, talking about being on a, like, being on a, being on a bridge, 
I think this is very intentional in that, that mode of travel. Because when you travel, I don't know what it is, but often bridges really stand out to you. And then we get to the next part. I don't use this term all the time, but sometimes there are parts of an album or parts of a song that are what I refer to. The highest compliment I can give is it is my jammy jam. This part is my absolute jammy jam. <laughs> it is so badass. And it's and it, if it existed on its own without the rest of the song, it would not be good. It has to exist in that truce between this contemplative, beautiful singing about alienation and travel, and then mixed in with these bongos and this yelling, nah, nah, which this reminds me of Ewoks saying yub nub. And it reminds me of people like a tribal chant saying yub nub. I listened to it on the speaker and my dog thought it was barking. Toby, his ears went up, his ears went down. He looked around, he went to the, he went to the window, he looked outside, he tried to find the dogs. Yup, no. And then this like schizophrenic keyboard comes in. And then these drums, this like slightly like stilted military snare. Oh my God, it's so good. It's such a great part in the middle of this song. And then it stops. There's a break and she has these beautiful lyrics. I, I'll, I'm, glad you take, I'm glad you take me as I am, whatever shape with woman, man, black or blue, filthy cheat I am, and still you come to see me in the band. These lyrics really has warbled sounds in the back. Light and dark all at once, never lonely and holy metronomy, so dazzlingly dark because it's bright and truth is God and God is light. It really feels super Leonard Cohen-y to me in a very good way. Leonard Cohen's song by Joni Mitchell, which sounds pretty good to me, <laughs> just kind of warps and awesome. And then this part comes back again. Bum, da, bum, chop, chop. I might go so far as to say it's not just my jammy jam. It's my pajama jammy jam. That's, that's the highest level compliment I can give to a part of a song. It is so good. Feel free to tell me in the comments, what are your jammy jams in music? Because there's different jammy jams. I mean, so far, the main jammy jam that I have is from the Black Country New York album this year. Um, well, talk, I've talked about that enough. Um, and then there's this cool part at the end where like the voice gets cut up, and, and, and they do this a couple times, where they take her beautiful voice, and they cut it up, and they chop it up, and they chop it up, to where it's like <clears throat> stilted and all over the place. Sorry, I have to have a sip of my coffee. Oh, and, uh, buy my merch um, at the Spring Store. Not at the Springsteen store. <laughs> that is the word. God damn. If I ever make that joke again, unsubscribe and resubscribe again. Okay, so I'm going to go through the rest of the album a little bit quicker. But that, that excitement that I told you about that one song, that's all the way throughout the album. All those things. Do you see what I'm talking about? That truce? You know, like this crazy jammy jam part, which is just taking a lot of electronic stuff and acoustic stuff and these beautiful lyrics and this beautiful singing and musicianship and avant-gardeism all together in a very pleasant song. So first song is called Neon, which is basically does all those things the same way. Neon is very much a companion piece, I think, to, to not bridge over troubled water, concrete over water. Guitar and voice, kind of folky and nice in the beginning. Red eye after dawn, I see you cross the hill. Swallow me whole and pummel me down like a needle. All arrive into the steeple. Didn't they stop to watch a neon go down over the island? Throbbing will make it another morning, dif despite the difficult morning. Uh, her lyrics are often like this, in this mode. Very poetic, uh, obscure, but comprehensible. You know, that thing that poetry can do where you understand what she's saying, but you can't explain what she's saying. Uh, we'll make it to another morning despite the difficult morning. You know, that's, I don't get that at all, but I sort of understand it, and it definitely works with the atmosphere that Taylor Sky is creating, Taylor Me is creating. Um, this weird, odd chorus announces this change, and there's this muted, blown out drums and keyboard sound. Again, just like in that, in the, in the stamp. And then the, the second verse comes in, there's this weird tick, tick sound of a drum machine, more vocal acrobatics. Then the second chorus got these twirling synths and this guitar going high. And then there's this real drum set, not a drum machine, and it's totally blown out. And the guitar is totally clipped out. And it's like flanged insanity. And again, when I'm talking about this balance, about no one ever going too far, it's never too earnest, it's never too ironic. All these sounds, it's not too upsetting. And it has this really epic ending 
which is probably the only part of the entire album that does actually remind me of Black Country New Road because they are very good at having these extended, long, epic endings, and that's what we have here. Next song is one of the two songs on the album that I didn't like until this morning. I mean, I liked it, but it was one of my less favorite songs. Now I think I like it as much as the rest. Jennifer B. I don't know who Jennifer B. is. You know, the album's called I Love You, Jennifer B. Um, I have imagined it is Jennifer Beals <laughs> the entire time, the actress from the 80s. Um, so maybe it's Jennifer Beals. Because she was the one in Footloose, right? No, not Footloose. What's the maniac, maniac? Dancing, not what? What is that? Was that Footloose? No, it's not Footloose. You tell me. What? Jennifer Beals. What's the movie with the, with the the bucket that falls on her head? How am I not remembering that? Because Footloose is Kevin Bacon. I didn't watch any of those movies growing up. I didn't watch Footloose. I didn't watch Dirty Dancing. And I didn't watch this third one that I can't think about. Anyways, so that's who I imagine Jennifer B is. I imagine her dancing in a leotard with a big bucket of water falling on her head. Um, it's probably someone different. What's cool about this is it has almost like a phone tone beat. Lots of futzing around with the drum bell, I mean the drum sounds like cowbells, sort of goofing around. Again, a real playful nature here. Uh, the chorus has just an otherworldly hook, which is really good. I'll talk about that later. More interesting lyrics, like a DJ, like a dancer, your arms and legs covered in little white hairs. Is this Jennifer Beals? <laughs> From the movie that I can't... <laughs> the song is She's a Maniac. She's a Maniac. But what is the name of that movie that it's from? Anyways. No, like a mohair sweater. That sweet baby you smiled and said to me as if I couldn't have said it any better. This nice kind of loving lyrics about this person who's very graceful. Um, and then later, it gets sort of oddly sort of sexual. Um, like I could be your stripper and get me a switch... I'm a game girl, you know, a Switch could be a Nintendo Switch or it could be like a, you know, like a, like a whip. Um, and then there's this weird part where like a Southern voice comes in and the Southern accent says like, goddamn crochet pants staring at who knows what. I don't really know what's going on here. It is funny though, because this is the song with the most pronounced British accent in the singing. Um, and then this, this chorus that's just so catchy and so wonderful. And again, this, this, I suppose that's another balance or truce we could throw on here catchiness and avant-gardism as well. Uh, gorgeous outro with this loop sound and this just... Uh. And the next song is Greatest Hits. Oh boy. Uh, you, you thought that I had an interesting theory about Jennifer Beals. Where do you hear my theory about the origin of Greatest Hits? So the sound has this kind of piano and like a pre-packaged drum machine drum line. And to me, this is an intentional title. And, and I think it's a title referring to popular songs, because I think it's supposed to be almost an experiment in sounding like popular songs. Now, the first song is very easy to spot, Praise You by Fat Boy, to the point where you can listen to this song and sing those lyrics. Been a long, long time together, through the hard times and the good. Okay, like, <laughs> how to praise you like that. Okay, like, ding, 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 ding. And even later in the song, there's this, like, Miami Sound Machine breakdown with this percussion bit that's a lot like Praise You Like I Should. But it, it doesn't sound like a ripoff. It just sounds like it's trying to echo that sound. But then there's this person saying, be, 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 be. I don't know why I look like a beaker. All right, so there's that sound, and I'm, <clears throat> I'm going way out on a limb here. There was a pop hit in all of Europe, but particularly in France. I think it made it to England, called Dur Dur Etre Bébé. Dur Dur Etre Bébé by Jordi. It's hard, hard to be a baby. It's difficult to be a baby. It's this like novelty song where there's this like little kid singing about why is this difficult to being a kid. Fais pas ci, fais pas ça. And I think this is sampling one of the times that that little French kid says baby. Bébé, which makes sense in the concept of greatest hits, matching the high and the low. But I don't know. That's just my theory, a sky theory. Um, just really cool, more kind of, again, like her lyrics are sometimes either like, like, they're, like they, they touch on the sexual um, and they touch on the sexy, like they touch on feeling 
like you look good or they touch on sexuality, but it's never like erotic. You know what I mean? Like it's, it, it does, it's not, tr- I don't think it's trying to titillate. I'll put it that way. So, you know, like the lyrics here, for the first time, I like it when he's inside thinking about the next time he's coming around to mine. You know, I think you could read that very directly as being a sexual line, but it doesn't quite feel that way. Um, at times it sounds like a, like, and like it, he's changing the channel on a radio in the other room. I guess the term I came up with was ironically coquettish. <laughs> so whenever she's being coquettish, it feels somewhat ironic. This is the only song on the album where I really hear lots of bass work, like the, the you know, bass, the doop, the doop. Oh no, my hair is totally falling apart now. Now it looks terrible. I'm going like full flock of seagulls. Um, and then there's this like really fun part where it feels like <laughs> it feels like Georgia Ellery's really jumping into the fun part. You know, for the rest of the album, it seems as though a lot of the fun stuff gets to be left to Taylor with his production. But here she has this whole line: "Imagine I'm Madonna. Imagine I'm the Madonna in blue, in pinks." You know, the con- the contrast between Madonna, the, the mother of Christ, who generally wears blue, and then Madonna wearing pink. And then, like, she mentions Marie Antoinette, and the whole time she just sounds like Debbie Harry. <laughs> so it feels like it's in this sort of playful, sexy, sexual realm. Next song is What Is It All About? Um, what's this four years been about? I don't, I, this feels to me like this might be a song about the band itself, or it might be about a relationship that broke up. Um, if you're an American, <laughs> when you say, What has this four years been about? you just assume it's about the Trump presidency. I, I, I'm not going to be that um, colonial to assume that the rest of the world feels the same way. Uh, this is the most acoustic song, you know, got strings and acoustic guitars, very powerful strings, a lot of words being you know, communicated here. Um, there's chimes, and any song that's good that possesses chimes has done something nearly impossible. A beautiful kind of blown out part, so many great production details. Then we get to the stamp, Concrete Over Water, which I listened to again this morning. So my daughter was, was fussy. My baby was fussy. She was kind of... And I just thought, well, what if she calmed down when I played this? And she did. Up until the jammy jam part ended. By the second verse, she was crying again. But for the first part, <laughs> you know, I was sitting there, I was holding it, I was like, boom, kipom, ba, ba. You know, and it's like, you know, like, booping her on the nose with each, ba, ba. It's altogether too cute. Speaking of babies, but not cute, let's get to the next song, Angst. I think it's a harp being played here. It could be a harmonium or some kind of harp-like instrument. And the lyrics here are interesting. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say these are intentionally evo- like evocative. Sorry, Toby's up. He heard me do the barking. Um, I think they are intentionally evocative uh, of female bodies and of menstruation. I think if we read these lyrics like about like organs bobbing in the dark and my stomach is a vase and tubes, it does feel that it's largely about sort of female bodily process. But, but I think that's, I don't think that's what the song's about, but I think it's using some of those thematics to get into this larger theme about angst, about feeling bad, about feeling anxious, which is kind of what I was trying to tie into here, that that's how I've been feeling. I've been feeling this angst. And the funny thing is, she says, <clears throat> if it were a baby, I would name it angst. If she had a sadness, she would name it angst. And then all the time, you know, Taylor's goofing around with a harp sound and reversing it. It's haunting. It's gorgeous. When I birthed her, I brought, I bought the red. When I met her, I cried the sticks for her. She came out crimson on the bathroom floor with her baby weight. She kept me down on the blue linoleum. You know, there is something kind of Cronenberg-y sort of body horror-ish about this when we're talking about like birthing and red and on the floor and the blue linoleum. But at the same time, it's gorgeous. And then it ends with this very interesting chopped up voice, high and weird, chopped up all over the place. The intervals that are being chopped up, again, so I've, I've referenced Leonard Cohen multiple times and I'm not, I don't just mean Hallelujah, which is the song most people know by Leonard Cohen. There's a lot of the world weary, um, uh, cool and um, surprising emotion that is inherent in Leonard Cohen's music and that's that's the main reason I compare this to that but this is definitely the 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 intervals in the song hallelujah which is okay i mean that song is basically happy birthday it's always in our head 
Deborah's the next song. Craftwork, baby. <laughs> it just sounds a lot like like the Craftwork arpeggios. Just that that kind of like stuff. And then these lyrics, like maybe the most universal lyrics. Pain is real and love is real, but pain is also growth and grief is just love with nowhere to go. Odd, like oddly straightforward, nice lyrics there. Um, it, it develops and there's this like great Middle Eastern part, not quite a jammy jam, but still an amazing part. I saved the term jammy jam. There's only like one or two jammy jams a year, two or three, you know, but this great like a sign of a good album is when I have different catchy parts in my head at the same time while I'm talking about it. Cause I don't edit, I don't edit these videos, so I just yeah, I get the songs and enter in my head. And right now I can like I can do the whole breakdown here, which is cool, you know. Like it's cool I'm able to do that. And then if I want to, I could switch to the other one. Chop chop, you know. Like that's that's really good. This music has, has latched onto my brain. It's like. Got in little opioid receptors in my brain, just right there. Um, lots of video game themes in this song as well, like press Y to see the moon or something like that. Um, so there's there's a sort of gaming theme going on here, I guess, with the Switch lyrics as well. Uh, the outro reminds me a lot of Laurie Anderson, but again, like that just could be sexism, okay? <laughs> like the, the problem with, with, with being a, a music critic, even as amateur as I am, is that you can't help but compare things to other things. But whenever you're comparing people, it can be awfully reductive. So if, if I hear a young woman say the word, hello, in the middle of a song, I'm going to think of Laurie Anderson, you know, the great avant-garde art rocker from the 80s. <clears throat> but am I just saying that because they're both women? Am I just marginalizing marginalized people? You can tell me in the comments. Glasgow is the next song. Glasgow. Glasgow. Um, this is the, the example of, this is the song that I didn't like it until this morning. I mean, I liked it, but now I love it. Very cool. Just this guitar coming in. Just, I wish I was on the road. High, gorgeous voice. These lyrics of, of, of youth and travel. I touch myself every time I see what's missing from my life. Beautiful, weird lyric. I assume this is a reference to the song I Touch Myself by the Divinals. Just this wall of guitars, the most Joni Mitchell style singing. These interesting lyrics about Glasgow. You know, I'm not going to Glasgow. I'll see you after the show. Um, very singer songwritery and very good. But then at the end, it gets kind of blown out. And like the vocals get a little bit out of tune and there's like these bell sounds. And just a quick note, if you're watching this video, if you haven't heard the album Walt by Walt Disco, uh, they're from Glasgow. Uh, you know, unlear I think Unlearning, is that what it's called? Yeah, Unlearning. This is a great album. If you're interested in Glasgow, Glasgow is one of my five favorite cities. Uh, you know, it's, it's probably Paris, Marseille, uh, Montreal, uh, Memphis, and, uh, and Glasgow. Like, places to visit, you know. I love Rochester, that's where I live, but I wouldn't tell you to come visit it. Um, but yeah, anyways, if you're looking for good new music from Glasgow and you like glam, that's it. Uh, Lancaster Court uh, is the second to last song. Another song that took me a while to get into. I think what it is is the more earnest a song was, the more acoustic a song was, the harder it was for me to get into because like I get so excited by really good electronic production. <laughs> I just get like, Jojo the dog face boy, I just get like all excited. I'm like, yeah, 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 I just, oh, it's so cool. What's he going to do next? That I can sometimes overlook just good musicianship and songwriting. Um, just this very kind of minor tune and voice. What I like about it is there's like some epic sounds underneath, with like like timpanis, like actual timpanis. Um, and then he meant she mentions I feel him coming as the bells pound in my chest. Like the last song ended with the sound of bells, so that might be there. Um, and then the whole song is about this struggle of confronting yourself in the mirror. You know about like choosing the book and the pen over the mirror, but never being able to stop looking at yourself. And this ties in, I think, to this larger theme that I've been talking about the whole time, which is you know she's out on the road. And the thing about traveling, you know, like when you travel to Memphis, <laughs> when you travel to Montreal, um, you know, like when you travel, you don't have to confront yourself, and and you can just be out there being fabulous and seeing new things, and. When you're making art, you don't have to confront yourself. When you're doing things, you don't have to confront yourself. You know, when you're playing Pokemon Go and listening to Pod Save America, you don't have to think about 
you don't have to be present with yourself. Because when you're present with yourself, good things can happen, like being with your baby and listening to great music, or you can realize that you hate yourself and you've wasted your life, right? You never know. We never know how it's going to break, <laughs> right? We never know how it's going to break. So I do think that's a big part of this. And it's funny because I, I, I imagine it creates, again, this easy truce where we have uh, you know, Georgia out in the world and she's trying to avoid looking in the mirror. And then the production, I just <laughs> have this image of Taylor with a mirror directly behind his computer and just like staring into the mirror for hours, like coming up with the right beats. It's great. Then we get to the last track. Hey, you want avant-garde electro? Woo! We got it, baby. 50-50. <laughs> just vocals. Did I say baby? God damn it. I said baby. I have to, I have to have a sip of coffee. If I say the word baby, I have to have a sip of coffee. That's just a rule. Mm. But not baby like my baby, not like an actual baby. Oh my God, now my hair is just, it's like becoming a mess. So this is just wild. Kind of, you know, daft house music. She keeps saying these words, this is like the sample. I hear the po lax cabin. The po lax cabin. The po lax cabin. The po lax cabin. So I imagine it's like, um, someone in Edgar Allan Poe's family who goes uh, camping, but all of the cabins are rented. So the Poe lacks cabins. And then she like sings like all the vowel sounds. Ah, e, o, u, ah, e, o, u. And then eventually the voice comes in with like these weird other like language. And then there's a total house explosion, house music explosion, and she sings just nice. Like she just sings just clearly. And she talks about, I have to think about that. She's 50-50. 50-50. 50-50. What does 50-50 represent? A balance. A truce. Nailed the landing, everybody. Do you understand? It's 50-50. This album is 50-50. The song is 50-50. 50-50 between all these things. This gorgeous voice and this bizarre keyboard interaction. So much playing around. Awesome, super sick breakdown. Cool cut-up sounds. It's just... How did I end my... So I'm looking at my notes. I don't have a script. I have notes. Cool cut up sound sows. Down amp is rad. Okay. So sound sows. Down and is rad. There you go. That's what I have to say about it. Uh, these are my Patreons. I'm going to buy this album. That's for sure. Um, some of these people left. So... That's cool. Thank you for being here. I forgot to take you off. Rod down there just joined. If, if you join soon, I probably won't print out another one of these, so you might get a, a handwritten name on here. It's nothing nothing personal. I just, uh, uh, it's hard to figure out who's a Patreon and who's not sometimes. So thank you to all these people. Uh, I'm just going to make sure that uh, you can see their names clearly. This is my big weekend show. I'm very excited to get this video out there uh, and to share all the good news about this great music. Okay, I'm gonna go make some pancakes. You know it, Sunday morning. Till next time, there's the camera.